everybody. Thank you so much for attending the Windbreak and Shelter Belt session here. I'm Billy. I'll be the moderator for these two talks. Uh, we've got 30 minutes for each talk, 20 minutes for talking, 5 minutes for Q&A, and 5 minutes for, for switching. So uh, I'm probably going to cut most questions off at that 25 minute mark. And if you got extra questions, we'll be here afterwards and can answer them. So up first, we have Jim Brandle from the University of Nebraska talking about indirect impacts of agricultural windbreaks on atmospheric carbon balance. I uh, should mention that this work, work was sponsored by the National Agroforestry Center, and a lot of this work uh, has been done by William. William is my PhD student, and he'll be speaking next. William is a Fulbright scholar and was fortunately to came to Nebraska and has done an excellent piece of work. Agroforestry, we've seen this a lot this morning. Uh, I will go ahead and, and mention some of the uh, demands that we have on it. Tom mentioned the uh, increasing need for food. Tom mentioned uh, that we are using most of our highly productive agricultural land. And you'll have to excuse me, my hope my voice will last for the session. We'll have to do it best. Uh, reducing atmospheric greenhouse gases is one of the key aspects of dealing with climate change or some of the issues that we're facing. And somehow we've got to find some way either store those greenhouse gases or reduce the amount that's released. And this talk is about how much, how to reduce some of the uh, release. Agroforestry is a great tool, it does both, okay? There's a good article in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation uh, last year, 12, dealing with this issue. Okay, some of the benefits, you know all these. There we've listed them over and over and over again. They store carbon, reduce wind speed, control erosion, protect homes. Every one of these has, if you put in a windbreak, there's a direct storage. But every one of them also has an impact on energy balance associated with that operation. It also has then a, a potential to reduce, uh, release the CO2 or other greenhouse gases. One an interesting one that we're going to talk about a little bit is livestock. I'll mention this one first. It's not part of our, our discussion today, but it was mentioned during the discussion at one of the tables this morning. Windbreaks reduce the time it takes to feed an animal out to market weight, which means there's less time on pasture, less time in the feedlot. Believe it or not, if you can reduce that time, not only do you save feed costs, which is what we've been telling landowners forever, but it also reduces the time. And when you reduce the time in, in the feedlot or the pasture, you reduce, reduce the amount of manure that's produced. Reduce the amount of manure that's produced, reduce carbon or methane. So there's another greenhouse gas. I wish I could tell you we had numbers there, but we don't have those yet. We're gonna spend our time talking about field and farm dead windbreaks, in particular the two aspects of it. From the fields windbreak standpoint of view, it's the land that we remove from production. Every one of those acres has a number of different inputs. We're going to talk a little bit about fertilizer and herbicide. We're also going to talk about farmstead windbreaks that reduce their heating and cooling needs. And basically, we're talking about the amount of propane or natural gas or electricity that's used to heat and cool a home. So let's look at first at the windbreaks, and as I say, uh, we're talking about single or double row windbreaks, fuel windbreaks. Anything above that is not economical from a farm production standpoint of view. As long as you're taking somewhere around three to five percent of the land product out of production, you're still economically uh, viable. You're going to produce more on fewer acres as long as you're in that three to five percent range. Uh, we knew that, as I say, we have a reduced. Uh, Input cost, and these three are the ones that we're going to talk about. The others will, will be there, but we don't have strong data. So there's are just two examples of uh, parallel windbreaks on a particular farm. Okay, from a farmstead windbreak, <coughs> we're typically talking about a minimum of three rows in order to control the snow and provide protection. The further north you go, the more rows you have. Canadian prairies, you're usually looking at nine or ten rows minimum. To control the wind that that nose can 
emissions. Reductions in, in heating costs run from 10 to 40 percent, depending on where you are. Reduction in cooling costs, about 10 percent. Uh, the amount or the percentage of, of uh, saving is directly influenced by the construction of the house, how well it's insulated, <clears throat> how, how, how new is the house. We've come up with new construction techniques, and so these have improved the efficiency of heating and cooling at home. <clears throat> The different, the different uh, energy products have all kinds of different units. And so we've converted all of our units to uh, kilograms per carbon equivalent. So every one of our units will be talking about the same equivalent. I should say we also, you may see some of them <coughs> have megagrams per uh, carbon equivalent. That's just to keep the numbers small enough to fit on the screen. So diesel, for example, one kilogram of diesel fuel is 0.94 kilograms of carbon equivalent. We looked at the effect across the United States and divided it up, the United States up into uh, 12 regions. Those colors are different on your screen than they were on mine, as we all know. <clears throat> uh, but we we're focused on, on the Great Plains, and, uh, Northern United States, uh, Corn Belt, for three in particular. Okay, so we're describing the farm characteristics of, of what we're what we're asking to um, estimate the amount of the savings. So farm size, <coughs> 60 to the 300 acres or hectares, excuse me, to 600. The corn we went with a corn, soybean, winter wheat rotation. Uh, input states. Every state publishes an extension publication every year that tells you how much of this or that goes into a production of a given crop. And so that we use that as our source of the crop operations for given states. Uh, and the farm home, we assumed it was adequately insulated. We know there are a lot of older homes out there that are not, but we assumed it was. We assumed two sizes of the home, 230 square meters and 270 square meters. We assumed most farm homes either use propane or electricity very few use natural gas, as they usually the infrastructure is not there for that source. All of the information on energy came from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And again, we separated the homes we built before and after 2000. That seems to be the, the time frame for changes in construction. <coughs> so overall, from the field windbreak standpoint of view, uh, looking at that crops, and we put potato in here for this particular crop because it's such a high energy user. So here we have uh, uh, crop residue. We have a number of small things we'll talk about in a moment. We'll have uh, the fertilizer use and the fuel use. When we started out, we figured the fuel use would probably be the largest, surprisingly, uh, fertilizer and crop residues generated the most CO2. So potato, and this is irrigated versus non-irrigated. Corn is the second highest irrigated <coughs> versus non-irrigated. Wheat and soybeans at least. Primarily, soybeans is low because of the lack of uh, additional fertilizers added for those situations. We looked at a very specific example now. Uh, carbon emissions avoided for Nebraska, uh, corn, soybean, wheat rotation. 300 hectare acre farm. Um, 15 hectares would be in uh, windbreaks, 5%. Okay, so here, here's our equivalent emissions. Uh, 90, we're looking at 90 bushels per acre for the corn, 39 bushels per acre for soybeans, and we need 50 bushels. Those are all somewhat low, but they are statewide averages. Uh, fuel, 49, 125 for the fertilizer, that's high. We have a total reduction for that 15, okay, so that's 4,020 kilograms of carbon equivalent per hectare per year. We can multiply that out because it's on a per hectare basis. Okay, let's look at the farmstead wind breaks. Again, three to nine rows. We assumed in this analysis 20% reduction in the heating and fuel. It wasn't the lowest, 
It wasn't the highest. We have everything between 10 and 40 percent. We assume 20 percent. And savings directly influenced by house construction. Can't forget that. The older the home, the more the, the windbreak benefits. The newer the home, the better insulated the home, the less impact the windbreak. We just looked at the climate zones. Uh, this is the northern zone. Uh, what we're talking about is how many day, heat injury days they have. On the opposite extreme, we're looking at the southern zone, and here we're concerned about the number of cooling days. How many days do they have to run the air conditioner versus how many days do they have to run the furnace? So here's the annual carbon equivalent emissions and reductions from heating and cooling. Uh, zone one is that northern one, 20% reduction, 360 uh, kilograms carbon equivalent per year. It doesn't sound like much until you start to think about in that zone, in that north central zone, which is basically what that northern zone is, well over 50% of the houses, farmhouses in that zone have protection. Compare that to that same zone, only about 2% of those farms <coughs> have fuel breaks. So the value of a farmstead windbreak to home farmers and homeowners in that region is well known. So these are real savings. This is uh, after 2000, so we're here we're looking at newer homes, better insulated, uh, and except for most spinaces, we're looking at less emissions. So that's the story. Uh, I think we saved a few minutes there for you. Uh, my voice won't go on much longer anyway, so we'll call it quits and open it up for questions. Great. We've got five full minutes for questions, so. Yeah. You? Okay. Yeah. Um, the calculations on, on the savings. Was that based on the uh, reductions in fuel alone, or was that considered the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions as well? It's, re it's the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So the reduction in fuel, if you use one gallon less or one pound less or whatever it might be, you would reduce the amount of carbon dioxide or methane or whatever that's associated with that one unit of fuel. And so that's what was reported, is the amount of carbon dioxide or methane or whatever greenhouse gas is appropriate for that particular uh, fuel. But what about greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the soil, from the ecosystem? No, it did not consider the soil emissions. In the, the field wind, <coughs> excuse me, the field wind breaks, we consider only those re reductions that occurred from the lowering of the input costs or the input, your fertilizer, fuel, uh, and, and uh, herbicides. And those did not include, and that's something we need we need better handle on how much, how many greenhouse gas units are emitted in the production of fertilizer. How much are, uh, greenhouse units, how much greenhouse gas units do we have in the transport of that fertilizer from the location of production to the farmer's field. Same way with all the herbicides. So those we have very poor numbers on how much natural gas is used to create a ton of nitrate, uh, not only nitrate, say. Yeah. So in windbreak production systems, the fertilizer savings are coming from? Fertilizer savings are coming from those, those acres, those hectares that have trees on. Okay? We're no longer farming them. So I'm no longer running my tractor or equipment, et cetera, et cetera, over that. I no longer have seed costs, fertilizer costs, herbicide costs. Uh, those are the ones that we've generated and counted for. Right. And what percentage of the land like you, you, you account in our In the analysis we used, it was 5%. Oh. But typically, uh, fuel wood breaks are economic <coughs> anywhere between five and 3 and 5% of the land Converted to the plantation or to planting the Anything above that, uh, it's difficult to generate an, an economic value. 
It's just too many acres, or too many hectares <coughs> out of production. You didn't consider leaching reduction potentials? What? Leaching reduction potentials because of the safety net hypothesis and the presence of tree no. rows. No, we did not. And we didn't, we didn't account for any carbon that's stored in the soil. Okay? Um, when we do the direct, we will have we'll have some of those some of those carbon units associated with the roots, but not with soil carbon. Yeah. Um, your really last slide, so you were also saying that uh, the newer homes are bigger and also better insulated? Most of the data from the EIA says that newer homes tend to be larger, and that's true across the board, whether it's a, a farm home or a urban home. We tend to have built larger and larger homes over the last years, okay? Uh, they also have better uh, construction techniques, uh, better insulation, better furnished units and more efficient units in, in terms of heating and cooling, all of those come into account for the, old, new, the newer homes. The older homes assume that they're using the older techniques. In all, both cases, we assume that the homes adequately insulate. Uh, we know <coughs> some of them will be better, some of them will be worse. We know some of the older farm homes have absolutely no insulation at all. They were built in the 40s and 50s when energy was not an issue. <laughs> the, new, the newer homes are so much more efficient and they, you know, that maybe the, the energy savings aren't as much realized by new, by homeowners with newer homes, but are they still claiming the shelf above because they like the comfort and happiness factor? You know, the energy savings aren't quite as clear to them. I, I, I fall back on some, on just observations. Most of the comparable units that we see built in and around uh, urban areas, all the five and ten acre ranchettes or whatever you want to call them out there around there. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many of those have been great. There's always ones that don't. <coughs> we have a state senator who has his house right on top of the hill with no protection, but that's, that's him. <laughs> Most of the homes, 57% of the homes in the north central region, farm homes, the north central region, which is North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Okay. So, Did you ever work that at minus 20 degree <coughs> weather? Oh, I'm from Western South Dakota. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We have no old. problem convincing, convincing <laughs> one of the people who live on the farm, and but outside, <laughs> usually the woman, that we need to do this. Okay. And so that's usually the first place that the trees go in. And contrary to what Tom was saying this morning, we find in Nebraska that the next largest re or next most important reason for farmers planting windbreaks is to encourage wildlife. Mm -hmm. Contrary to what our Dean of Parks says. Mm -hmm. well, you like to hear birds. Absolutely. If there's no trees, there's no birds. Right. Yeah. So we're not, we haven't, we haven't really, we did, this doesn't really cover all the other benefits of windbreaks and biodiversity and pollination and so forth and so on down the line. Now, three to five percent um, threshold for remaining productive, does that hold true across the majority of, of crop types or, or is that limited to um, basically uh, field grains and rice, uh, uh, wheat, soybeans, corn? Almost, almost all of my work has been in the commodity crops. And so it does work, does hold true for those. I would assume it holds true for most others. On some of the high, high value specialty crops, such as vegetables, I suspect you could push that higher because of the value of the crop. And, and uh, the need to produce a crop that is high quality. When I take corn to the elevator, I don't get paid for any quality. If I take a vegetable to the farmer's market, that's what they're paying for, that appearance. And so I would assume that that would be, you could probably push that higher. Is that pretty good research that's been done on most of that? 
that's well, well documented and for for uh, um, for commodities. Uh, On commodities, yes, there's there's tons of research uh, <clears throat> going back to some of the earliest stuff uh, in the U.S. by Bates and some of the others at that at that point. Uh, one of the outstanding studies was done in, in the '60s by a fellow by the name of Steckler, who did uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, corn and seal wheat, excuse me, up and down the Great Plains. Uh, there are several publications. Uh, John Court uh, summary of worldwide data on crop yields is a key publication on that aspect of it. And I think Tom mentioned that comes out to about 15%. I'm not talking about one more. Wind rows are being used, have, uh, that they're actually pruning the, the roots so you don't have water competition between the crops. You know, if you, if you prune, you eliminate that crop. You eliminate the crop competition zone. Yeah. But you, and we've, we've done some work on that. Um, I wish, I wish that farmers would pay, place the same economic analysis on the cost of root pruning that they do on everything that else. Yeah. That, and that's the excuse you get. I have a tractor, I can borrow the plow, but they don't want to take into account the fuel and the labor and any of the other inputs that are there. Those are things I normally have. I not That doesn't cost me anything. I know. I, you know, I, I don't understand why they don't do it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's my argument. Yeah, but it, it doesn't I, I, But right now, they're tearing down shelter belts because of water competition, negating the gains they get. Now, I sit, I, I'm in the South Texas. I mean, I'm in the South Plain. To cut down a shelter belt, they ought to be shot. I, well, I would agree with you. <laughs> and in, in that situation, I'd argue root prune. Yeah, but in any other situation, I'd say it's not. But they're going in Kansas now. They're, they're, you know, you see bulldozer after bulldozer uh, taking down windrows. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's disaster. It's sad. Yeah. It's sad. Right. Thanks a lot, man.